2020. I want to let you guys know I did send out an email earlier to let everybody know I have created a practice test for your next face-to-face -face test. Uh, I'm shooting for next week, so the practice test will be definitely open next week. It's just a matter of whether I'm going to make the uh, test be due Sunday or if I'm going to give you a couple days into the following week. So, uh, when I say due Sunday, I'm not talking about this coming Sunday. I'm talking about the following Sunday. But I might even push it back to, you know, November uh, or something because the following week starts in November. So, anyways, just keep that in mind. The practice test is up. I'm probably going to put another practice test because I'd like to have you guys do a uh, another online test as well, mainly from a confidence standpoint, because I think once you take a uh, online test for the same two chapters and you do a really good job on it, it might make you feel uh, a little more confident and, and make you a little more, more relaxed on the face-to-face -face test. Uh, I'm not going to make it due before the face-to-face -face test, but you can do it before the face-to-face -face test. So that's the only major announcement I have. Now, what I wanted to go on from is last time we finished uh, calculating work and I had shown you sort of all the gory details uh, that in general work is equal to uh, the integral of F dot DL. And I mentioned how that was a, a one, a path integral. Mm. And two, I talked about the, the dot product, which was what is in the actual integral that is the path integral. When I say that work equals the integral of F vector dotted with DL vector, then that dot product was something we covered as well. And I showed you two ways to calculate that. It's uh, A dot B is equal to the magnitude of A times the magnitude of B times the cosine of the angle between them when they're tail to tail. But also A dot B is equal to the X component of A times the X component of B plus the X component of, or excuse me, the Y component of A times the Y component of B plus the z component of a times the z component of b and that is a scalar product so don't forget the other name for the dot product is a scalar product so when you take a dot product, you don't have a vector anymore there's no more i hats j hats or k and that sort of thing so far i know i've had a few people like four people have actually uh chatted me your first and last name so if you haven't go ahead and do that now for roll and I'm going to get cracking on sharing my screen with you guys. So here goes the sharing of my screen. And if I could stop yawning, that would be freaking awesome. <laughs> so any minute now, the screen should be, there it is. Okay. So what we found is in many cases, uh, the actual work can be just calculated as work is equal to F times D. And that's specifically when the force is already parallel to D, okay? Force is the uh, force being applied at D is the, the displacement vector from the original position to the final position. But if that force is not actually parallel to D, then we have to use work is equal to the component of F that's parallel to D times D, or you could also make it uh, the force times the component of D parallel to F. That works as well. But both of these can be written as uh, F times D times cosine theta, where you're imagining the F and the D as being tail to tail. And then theta is the angle between them. And then, of course, recognizing that, that turns into F dot D. And that's a pretty robust formula. However, it doesn't allow you for, uh, allow you hmm. To calculate the work if you're actually trying to do it along a, a long path and that long path has the force changing along it or has, for instance, the, the direction changing along it, all that good stuff. If you actually have to take into account a curving path and a changing force, then the more general result and the most general result is work is equal to the integral of F dot DL. And as I said, this is a path or line interval.
Okay. So, uh, for instance, if you were to write the force as, uh, let's say, F sub X, meaning the X component of the force, which is a function of X and Y, I hat plus F sub Y as a function of X and Y, <sighs> J hat, then this would obviously be a two-dimensional problem. If you had a three-dimensional, then you'd also have a FZ, and you might even have F as a function of X, Y, and Z. But the reason I'm pointing this out is, for instance, you could have a work problem you're trying to solve, and the work done is done as an object moves, let's say, from the origin, which is the point zero, zero, to, uh, let's say, one, at which it becomes one, one, or it might even go two, three, four, one, two, three, and then to point two, this might actually bring you all the way up to here. So you could actually be computing the work done in moving along this path. And this path has an equation y equals x squared. So if you, uh, to make it a line integral, to make the integral, take place on the path, you can replace all y's in f of x, y with oops, with x squared because y is x squared literally is the definition of the path now that also means if dl was actually equal to dy j hat then you would actually write dl as equal to 2x dx j hat. So that's a way you can go about implementing that the integral takes place along a specific path. The equation for the path was y equals x squared. So you replace all the y's with x squared and you replace the dy's with 2x dx. If you had an equation like y equals uh, 3x plus 4, then you would replace dy with 3dx. Or if you had y equals uh, negative 4x, then you'd replace dy with negative 4dx, that sort of thing. So that's something you do. The other thing you have to do is you must, well, let me not write it this way. You must choose the or choose to show to show the direction of integration uh, with either dl or the limits of integration. Uh, which ever you choose is okay, but you have to choose exactly 
one way. Okay. Then the other way is not used. I should write that a little differently. The other way is not used and you make that just go I don't think I like where that or turn right here. You make that ooh. That other way. become increasing in the, let's, let's say, I don't like that wording either. Then the other way is not used and you make that other way, uh, let's say point in the direction. Make that other way point in the positive coordinate direction. So what I mean by that, thank you. What I mean by that is, for instance, in this case, we're going in the direction of increasing X. That's clearly the integration direction we're going. So I can choose, for instance, I can choose DL to show direction. Then my uh, my limits of integration. become uh, integral from x equals 0, y equals 0, to, and in this case, I'm going to say uh, 2, 4. So in other words, uh, depending on which variable I'd be integrating, it might be x, it might be y, so I had to allow for both of those. So I'd either make the range of integration z x equals 0 to x equal 2 or y equals 0 to y equal 4. Either one would be acceptable. And uh, dl is going to equal positive dx i hat. So notice the direction I was going is in the positive direction. So lo and behold, it it literally looks exactly like uh, like I didn't know anything about it being a line integral. That's sort of the nature of it. And that's why so many people can get it right, even though uh, they don't necessarily learn that this is something special. Now, let me show alternatively. Alternatively. I can use the limits of integration to show direction. So that we integrate from x equals 0 to x equals 2, or I'm trying to say the same thing again, but I'm trying to say it a little more clearly than I did the other time. y equals 0 to y equal 4. So that's the way you do it for the limits of integration while dl is just equal to dx i hat. 
So notice it's the same way in both of them because I'm happen to be going in the positive coordinate direction anyways. Uh, so that's not normally a big deal. Uh, but if I was, for instance, integrating the opposite direction, I'd either have to call uh, DL negative DX I hat and then integrate from X equals zero to X equals four, uh, two, or I could choose to do it by uh, limits of integration and I'd integrate from X equals uh, let's say x equals four to or no x equals two to x equals zero, and then my dl would be positive dx i hat because I'm just going to put that in the default mode, which is the positive coordinate direction. So that's the big deal with this. Uh, I'm saying a lot more than was told to me when I took this course. Like no one even told me that this was. Uh, a line integral or surface integral and, and that sort of thing when I did Gauss's law. I later figured that out myself. And it turned out that even though I didn't know it, I was able to get it right almost every time, mainly because the instructor chose very specific directions to calculate work and stuff like that. So that all worked out fine. But uh, I don't want you, you guys to have to go through that where you have to rediscover. So I'm telling you up front, that this crazy f equal or y equals the integral of f dot dl is a line integral. And the way you do a line or a surface integral is you've got to do something to the integrand to cement the idea that you're on a particular path or that you're on a particular surface in the case of a surface integral. For the line integral, there's normally an equation you can write for the path that you're trying to choose. Like in this case, I said y equals x squared. Uh, However, in the math world, they usually would use a parametric equation, so you do it a little differently, uh, but it still turns out to be the same answer. I mean, you know, a line integral is a line integral, and it shouldn't get two different answers uh, based on two different ways of doing it. It should always give you the same answer, or it's a meaningless quantity. So with that in mind, uh, the way we do it is we do try to lock the, the integrand down to the actual path by replacing all the y's, for instance, with x squared, if our path was y equals x squared, and replacing the dy's with 2x dx and that sort of thing. But we also have to specify the direction, and we can choose to specify the direction with dl. And if we choose to do that, then dl should point in the direction we're going, while the li limits of integration are just going to go from low coordinate to high coordinate. Or you may choose to let the limits of integration show the direction. So uh, the limits of integration would go from the first position to the final position, whereas DL would just point in the positive coordinate direction. So now that we've got all that uh, wording done, I want to actually show you a specific example. And uh, your book has an example, 7-4, that's sort of like what I'm doing. So I'm going to call this example 7-4. And we'll work it that way, even though this one is not so difficult. This is one where it just requires the dot product, not the actual, uh, not the actual integration. So uh, seven four. What we're going to have here is basically another box sitting on a level surface like this. I'm going to imagine the displacement vector D that's supposed to take place uh, actually has a magnitude of 100 meters. So the magnitude of D is equal to 100.0 meters. And that way I, I wrote that so that it would have three sig figs. Uh, I'm going to say, in fact, that we have a force acting on this uh, We'll have a force acting on this thing, and it's acting at a 37 degree angle. And actually, I'm going to call that a 36 point, uh, 36.86. So I'm going to call that a 36.9 degree angle. And I'm going to say that the force is F, which is going to be uh, 45.0 newtons. Okay. So that's the actual magnitude of that. And uh, that should be su sufficient. So what I want to calculate is uh, what is the work done 
And specifically, I'm going to do the work done uh, and I'm going to use it, uh, use a dot product to do it. So solution. Since the force does not change magnitude or direction and the path is straight work equals the integral of f dot dl reduces to oops that was just terrible I don't even reduces to F dot D is equal to work. Okay. So that's what I'm going to do. Work is equal to F dot D. Now, what I've got to do is compute F. I can see that F has an X component, F sub X, which is equal to the magnitude of F times the cosine of 36.9 degrees. And I know that the F has a Y component that is F times the sine of 36.9 degrees. Okay. So in this case, that's going to be 45.0 newtons times the cosine of 36.9 degrees. And of course, uh, if you look at your 345 triangle, which looks like this, there's three, there's four. This angle right here is 36.9 degrees. Uh, this side is, oops, that was supposed to go up a little higher. Sorry about that. And yeah, let me just draw this a little bit easier. So this angle is 36.9 degrees. This side is four. This side is three. This side is five. And obviously the cosine of 36.9 is four fifths. So if I divided 45 by five, I'd get nine. And then I multiply that by four, I get 36. So this should be 36.0 Newtons. And Fy should be 45.0 newtons times the sine of 36.9 degrees and sine of 36.9 would be 3 over 5 so I'm going to divide 45 by 5 that gives me 9 and then 3 times 9 is 27 so this one's going to be 27.0 newtons okay now that I have that I can say that f is just equal to 36.0 newtons i hat plus 27 whoops plus 27.0 newtons j hat and i can also say that d is going to be 100.0 meters all of that in the i hat direction okay so now I've constructed an F vector and a D vector. So now I can work out work is equal to F dot D, which is going to be 36.0 Newtons I hat plus 27.0 Newtons J hat. I'm going to put a square bracket around that and then separate it by a dot and then put 100.0 meters I hat like that. Now, uh, you can actually just apply my formula. Remember, the formula for the dot product is a sub x, b sub x, uh, a sub x times b sub x plus a sub y times b sub y plus a sub z times b sub z. 
but you can also do it by just uh, applying the distributive property uh, across this. And, and there's a reason why I'm showing you this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to FOIL this, even though I, I don't technically have two terms in the other one. But this I, this first term, has to hit that, and then it has to, uh, would normally have to hit another one, but it doesn't have another term over there. And then I have to let this second term hit it as well. So upon doing that sort of FOIL method, I think you'll see something uh, that's kind of interesting. So what I'm going to get is 36.0 newtons times 100.0 meters. That 100 is supposed to be uh, only three sig figs. Now, what I've done is I've automatically pulled the 36 newtons and the 100 meters to uh, the left-hand side, and now I'm just going to let the i-hat do a dot product with the i-hat from the other one. Okay, that's because the dot product is a linear operator, and you're allowed to pull the constants out in front and then just let the dot, the dot product act on the vectors itself. So that's what I got from 36 hitting the uh, 100 meters. Now I've got to let the 27.0 newtons hit the 100 meters. And in this case, it's going to be plus uh, 27.0 newtons. Again, using the linearity of the dot product. I'm going to pull the 27 newtons and the 100.0 meters out in front. And then I'm going to let the dot product act, which is J hat dot I hat. Okay. Now, the reason I do this is so you can see that the individual dot products of the I hats and J hats and K hats is a trivial thing to calculate. And you can see why the formula works the way it does. Uh, 36 times 100 is 3,600. Whoa. So I'm going to write 3,600, uh, and that comes out to be Newtons times meters, and then I hat dot I hat is the magnitude of I hat. Remember, all vectors with a hat on top of it are unit vectors, so I know uh, I hat has to have a unit of a, a unit magnitude. The other I hat, of course, also has a unit magnitude. And since they're identical vectors, the angle between them has to be zero degrees. Of course, the cosine of zero is one. So this whole thing becomes just one. The 36 Newton, uh, 3600 times Newton meters uh, times I hat dot I hat is just one. And then the other one is 27 times 100. That'd be 2,700. But J hat dot I hat is quite different. I've got a one for the J hat magnitude. I've got a one for the I hat magnitude. But I hat and J hat are different by 90 degrees. And the cosine of 90 is equal to zero. So this would be plus zero. But you finally get that it's 36, or I should say 3.60 times 10 to the third joules. And that's because one Newton meter is equal to one joule. Anybody have any questions on that? Okay. So keep that in mind, that way that I just computed the dot product is is something that can come in handy. Uh, I will show it to you rather quickly uh, this way. So let's say A dot B. We know that's supposed to be A X I hat plus A Y J hat. Of course, we'd also have a third term, but I'm just going to do two because it'll make it a, a little shorter. And I'm going to dot that with B X I hat plus B y j hat and then i'm just going to do the foil which is first and then that gives me a x oops that gives me a x i hat that a that x is a subscript by the way so let me write it down lower to make sure a x i hat dotted with b x 
pi hat plus a x i hat dotted with b y j hat plus a y j hat dotted with b x i hat plus a y j hat dotted with b y j hat equals now is the time where i can use the actual linearity of the dot product again that means you can pull the constants out in front so this first term is going to become a x b well again i'm writing the x is too high uh the first term is going to become a x b x times i hat dot i hat which we know is just one plus a x b y times i hat dot j hat which we know is zero plus a y b x j hat dot i hat which is zero plus a y b y j hat dot j hat which is one so you see that it does ultimately just equal a x b x plus a y b y okay so that's just a, a little extra bit of information to tell you we did the first then we did the outers then we did the inners and then we did the last like that okay so specifically this is the first this is the outers this is the inners and this is the last and this is the first this is the outers this is the inners this is the last and this is the first and this is the last so the outers and inners turned out to be zero any questions on that so i went way in more detail than was really necessary but we got a new problem now we did example seven four and i also further showed you how we got that crazy formula a dot b is equal to ax bx plus a y b y plus a z b z no questions all right let me make sure i'm looking at my chat everybody should have already chatted me your first and last name if you can't if you haven't please do that before you forget now I'm going to go on to the next section, which is where we're talking about work done by a varying force. And your book discusses this, not unlike the way I discuss it. Uh, so make sure you read that. That might further help elucidate what you're trying to make sense of in this uh, formula and how it's used. Uh, so definitely read that section seven. It's only a couple paragraphs that you need to read uh, and you'll be good to go. Uh, what it does specifically is it says work is equal to the integral of f dot dl and then it calls specifically f it says f is equal to f sub x i hat plus f sub y j hat plus f sub z k hat and it says dl is equal to dx i hat plus d y j hat plus d z k hat and that that actually is the sort of most general case okay but when you're going along a particular path if you're only using the x and y variable then you can drop the dz or if you're only using the y and z you can drop the dx uh but the main thing is when you're using only two of those, there's a relationship between those two variables, the X variable and the Y variable. And you can use that again, just like I used Y equals X squared to say DY would be two X DX. You could do the same thing here. You would make the DX I hat uh, stay as DX I hat, but you would change the DY to two X DX J hat. Okay. So that is a potential way of working it. Now let's try to actually apply it to a particular problem. So it turns out that there's something called Hooke's Law. And Hooke's Law says that 
when you apply a force F to any object. So if I try to compress, for instance, a two by four, or if I try to compress or stretch a spring, or if I try to stretch or compress a two by four, then the force that I applied will be equal to the negative of a stiffness constant called K times the amount that I actually compressed or stretched the spring. So uh, you're imagining a string having an equilibrium position that you might call uh, the center of the x-axis. So you'd say x equals zero when the spring is in equilibrium. And then if I compress the spring, then I'm pushing uh, it to x being a negative number. And what that negative sign in there tells us is that, okay, well, he's going to put a negative x in for or a negative number in for x. That's going to be multiplied by a negative times a k. So that's going to give me a positive. And that's exactly what it says. It's saying, hey, if you apply a force in the negative direction, the spring is going to respond with a force in the positive direction. Similarly, if instead of me pushing to compress the spring from x equals zero to x being a negative value, if I try to instead grab the spring and pull it in the positive x direction, then the x would have a positive value that would be multiplied by the positive k and then times the negative. That would give you, in fact, a negative quantity. And what would happen is that would mean that when I'm pulling the force in the positive x direction, or pulling the spring in the positive x direction, the spring responds by pulling back on me in the negative x direction. So the F equals KX gives you the magnitude of the force at any point, but the negative gives you the direction that the force is uh, applied in, and specifically the force from the spring, okay? So if I use that, then I can imagine a scenario like this. Let's say I have a wall and a frictionless uh, floor like so. And let's say I have a spring that has an equilibrium position on this mass M right here. So what I'm going to do is I am going to draw a coordinate system such that, uh, let's say we measure everything from the far left side of the mass. So what I'll do is I'll call this my Y axis. and I'll call this my x-axis. And now you can see what I was talking about. If I pull the mass to the right, right now it's in equilibrium, uh, but if I pull it to the right, it's no longer gonna be equal in equilibrium. The x value that I get by pulling it to the right would be wherever the right edge of that box ends up. And if I put that number in F equals negative kx, I'm gonna get a negative force, and that means the force is pulling to the left. Similarly, if I push the mass to the left, that means X is going to be a negative quantity. And when I multiply that by negative K, I get a positive, which means the spring will be pushing back on me in the positive direction. What I want to do is calculate the work done in moving the spring from X sub A equals zero to X sub B is just equal to a positive value of X. Okay. So I'm trying to say that the work done uh, in going from A to B is equal to the integral from A to B of F dot DL. Okay. So let's actually apply this. What we know specifically is that the force I'm actually applying is doing the work and we're wanting to calculate the work done by me. So what is the work done by my 
force. So remember, I'm going to apply a force to it and I'm not trying to speed it up or slow it down or anything. I'm just trying to stretch it. So if I apply a force uh, to the right to pull the mass to the right, then the spring is going to pull back to the left. But the magnitude of the force that the spring is going to pull back on is K times whatever amount I stretched it. I want to do just that amount because if I do any more, then I have a net force and that's going to cause the mass to accelerate. I want to just come up to that where it doesn't accelerate. And then like I can wait for, you know, some random atom to fly by and bounce into the mass that will push it a little bit to the right. And then I do it again, wait a little bit. So in doing this calculation, I'm going to assume the magnitude of the force I have to have for a given X is just K times X. And I'm dropping the negative because my force is actually pointing in the positive direction here. So I'm going to say this is equal to, oops, this is equal to an integral of the magnitude of the force is K times X. And in my case, it's going to point in the I hat direction. Now, here's where I choose. Do I want my DL to point the direction I'm integrating or do I, do I want my range of integration to do it? I'm going to do DL. So let DL show direction. That implies DL is going to be positive dx i hat. So I'm going to go ahead and put this in and say positive dx i hat. Now, since I did that, my range of integration just needs to go from small number to large number. My small number is zero. My large number is just plain positive x. Okay. So... I can again use the fact that the dot product is a linear operator and the fact that the K is a constant allows me to pull the K out in front of the integral and I'm going to get the integral from X equals zero to positive X and the result is going to be K or excuse me X DX times I hat dot I hat which of course is just one. And then the integral of x dx is one half x squared. So I get one half k x squared. And then I have to evaluate that from x equals zero to x equals positive x. Clearly the x equals zero uh, gives me zero. But the other case, I get one half k x squared. Okay. Now, if I try the other way, I could also do, let's say, work equals, let's say, from C to D equals the integral from C to D. I'm calling uh, this point in the previous part, I called this point A and this point B. And now I'm calling this point right here, I'm calling that C, and I'm calling this point right here negative X. I'm calling this point D. Okay, so setting up the same integral again, I still have the magnitude is going to be KX I hat, and this time I'm pushing in the negative direction. Uh, so I really need to write negative kx like that because that's the force I'm applying. And then I've got to do uh, choose my dl, either that or my limit of integration to show the direction I'm going. This time I'm going to let the dl show it again. So I'm actually going to be integrating in the negative dx i hat direction. And that means that uh, I need to put my range of immigration or my limits of integration, I need to put them in the positive coordinate uh, direction. Or specifically, I need to go from, uh, from a small quantity to a large quantity. And the small quantity, of course, is, dang it, 
is negative x and the large quantity, that's x equals negative x, and the large quantity is x equals zero. So that's what I mean. Again, let dl show direction implies dl is equal to negative dx i hat. Okay. So now I can do that. And when I do it, of course, I get a negative that comes out in front and a K that actually both of the negatives uh, are going to revert to a positive and the K is going to come out in front as well. And I get the integral from negative X to zero of X DX times I hat dot I hat, which of course we know is one and this again gives us uh one half k x squared from x equals negative x to x equals zero so in this case you get uh one half k and then it would be zero squared minus negative x squared like that which gives you a, a, a sort of a screw up negative sign uh, that shouldn't really be happening there uh, because it turns out the, the amount of work is actually just one half KX squared. But anyways, that's just an idea of trying to give you some way of seeing exactly what I meant by uh, showing your direction by the range of integration or the limits of integration or alternatively by using your dl vector so in this case i did get one half k i want to try to write it better uh this would be zero squared minus negative x squared like that and that of course gives you negative k one half kx squared which isn't right uh but anyways that that was somewhat useful for showing you what i meant uh Yeah, I can't think of any other reason for it to be that. Let me see. I did push in the negative direction because I changed it to there. I did go in the negative direction, so that was the negative dx that way. So that worked fine. Uh, yeah. Anyways, I guess that's it. And I guess that's why your book didn't actually take the time to show it in two separate parts because it, all, it falls down and gets you a negative. But I, I think you learned enough from that to understand what I meant. So hopefully this second part uh, was instructive for letting you understand what I meant by choosing the DL or the limits of integration to be uh, to show the direction we're going. Does anyone have any questions about that? Yeah, Jennifer. I do. Is was it the answer to the second part one half kx squared? Yes, one, uh, the okay. answer in both cases really should be just one half kx squared. There's okay. not a negative amount of work to be done there. Uh, Got it. So, yeah, I don't know why it turned out that way other than I should have maybe tried it beforehand. <laughs> but that's it. Anybody have any other questions? So let's see. Ignore. And I'm, I'm specifically, I want to say ignore because uh, that gave me a result that I know is not right. Negative one half kx squared. I know that's not right. But don't the, the negatives cancel out there? Uh, no, because the x, the negative x is actually squared, and it's literally inside the parentheses. I gotcha. That's what I was sort of hoping was going to happen, but I wasn't paying enough attention to realize that it wasn't going to happen that way. So I don't really know how I would have fixed it uh, to not do that. But like I said, use this second part and the first part for that matter to see what I mean by uh, saying that I'm choosing my direction with the DL or with the limits of integration. That's That was the only reason I did that was to give you some idea. Uh, when you're always going in the positive direction, there's almost no, no, uh, no chance for you to make a screw up on the line integral. Okay. All right, so we did that. And your book, by the way, just did, it went from zero to X is all it said. 
and uh, it computed one half kx squared, and it just left it at that. But it, that doesn't necessarily take into account what happens when you compress it as opposed to uh, expand it or stretch it. So we'll move on from that. Uh, another example. Okay, so let's look at uh, this is example 7.5. And I need my glasses, evidently. That's 7-5. Again, this is like the example in the book, but I'm uh, going to be doing it with slightly uh, different numbers and stuff like that in hopes that I'm not violating uh, copyright law, and I'm also not showing the picture. So uh, A, what it's saying here is a person pulls on a spring stretching at 3 centimeters. If a force of let's say uh, 90.0 newtons is required to stretch a spring to 3.00 centimeters from its equilibrium position, then how much work was done. So that's part A. And then part B, if, uh, if instead the person compresses the spring well, we it. to 3.00 centimeters from the equilibrium position. how much work is done. So solution, we just discovered that the work done in stretching a spring or compressing a spring from uh, a distance X from equilibrium is work is equal to one half K X squared. We also know, however, that 90.0 newtons is equal to K times 0 0.0300 meters. And that means K is equal to 90 divided by 0 0.003, or excuse me, 0 0.03. So 90.0 newtons divided by 0 0.0300 zero zero meters, that's three one hundred. So basically I'm going to make 9,000 and then divide it by 100, uh, or excuse me, make uh, 9,000 and then divide it by three. So it's going to be 3,000. So we get K is equal to 3,000 newtons per meter and this last digit is not a significant figure. So now I can do part A, work for stretching is equal to one half three, which actually I should probably call that 3.00 times 10 to the third Newton per meter. That's the way you're supposed to deal with numbers. 
uh, when they have uh, non-sig figs, insufficient sig figs to write it out. And then I'm going to say 0 0.0300 meters squared like that. And that's going to give me uh, 0 0.5 times 3,000 times 0 0.03 squared. That gives me 1.35 zeros, the extra digit. And notice that comes out to be joules. It's uh, Newton per meter times meter squared. So that's a Newton times a meter, and a Newton times a meter is a joule. So that's the work done in stretching, 1.35 joules. Now, if I want to do the work done in compressing, it turns out to be the same formula. So work compress is equal to 1 half kx squared again. So again, that's, that's me reiterating that last example that I did had a negative in front of it. It's not supposed to. I'm trying to show you again, this is the right answer. So this is one half times 3.00 times 10 to the third Newtons per meter times 0 0.03. In this case, you'd actually be putting it in the negative direction. So I'm going to slip that little negative in there, even though it's of no consequence, because we're going to have to square it anyways. And lo and behold, you get 1.350 joules equals work compressed. Any questions there? Now, that hook is the Robert hook that I sort of hinted at when I told you that uh, Newton, when he said, if I have seen further than others, it's only because I stood on the shoulders of giants. Uh, I said he, he actually stated that in front of the Royal uh, Society or the Royal Academy of Sciences, which I think is, no, it's Royal Society. Sorry about that. Uh, at that time, his one of his enemies, Robert Hooke, was the president of that organization. So it was that was the guy that had the short man's complex that Newton was kind of being a punk to. So, anyways, that that's the same hook guy. And by the way, this is not just a law. Hooke's law is not just a law for springs. It's just that springs are really easy for us to see that it's right. It applies, for instance, if you put a two by four in a wall and then you put a weight on top of it, that two by four is going to shrink a little bit. Uh, if you put a two by four in tension so that it's being pulled, it's going to stretch a little bit. But you can imagine if, if we're trying to do labs uh, with students around and stuff like that, and we're going to try to stretch a two by four, that's going to take a huge amount of force. And there's a lot of ways that people can get hurt that way. So we actually just use the springs because uh, they're a lot easier way of doing it. Okay. Anybody have any questions on that example? Okay. Well, your book gives us yet another uh, example with a variable force. So I'm going to go ahead and, and do that one as well, or at least something very much like it. It looks like it's only 620. This is example uh, 7.6. So what we're going to do is assume that uh, some particular device uh, applies a force according to X as follows. Let's say F of X uh, is the force. And its value is F0 times 1 plus, let's say, 1 ninth X cubed over X0 cubed. Okay, so if that was our actual force, and we might say that F0 is something like 4.0 newtons and x0 is going to be something like 0 0.00500 well i guess i'll just use two sig figs looks like everybody's doing that so i'll just be like the rest of the gang 
So that's meters there. And I'm going to say from X1 equals 0 0.010 meters to X2 is equal to 0 0.0. Three zero meters. Okay. How much work is done in applying the above force to move whoa, an object from X1 to X2. So that's our question. Here's our solution. Work is equal to the integral of f dot dl. We're going to say f is equal to f of x i hat. And we're going to say dl is going to equal dx i hat. Notice I am going from x1 to x2, which is in the direction of increasing x. And the force uh, is going to push in that same direction. So uh, worrying about putting the direction with the DL or with the limits of integration doesn't matter because in both cases, uh, it's going to be a positive DX I hat because that's the default if I don't use DL to indicate direction. And if I do use DL to indicate direction, it happens to be positive DX I hat. Similarly, the range of integration is going to be from 0 0.01 to 0 0.03 by default. But if I wanted to point the direction I'm going, it would also be 0 0.01 to 0 0.03. So we'll just work it out and see what happens. So work is equal to the integral of F0 times 1 plus 1 ninth uh, X cubed over X0 cubed. And then that's in the I hat direction, dotted with dx in the I hat direction. Uh, the I hats uh, do what they always do. I'm going to pull the F0 out in front because obviously that's a constant. And I'm going to get the integral of 1 plus 1 ninth. And I'm going to put the X0 down here cubed in the bottom there. And then times X cubed dx and then i hat dot i hat which of course we know is one and this gives us the integral of dx just gives me x because the dx multiplied by the one so that's just going to be a plain x and then plus one over nine x zero cubed now the integral of x cubed dx is one fourth x to the fourth and that's the total integral only now I've got to evaluate it from x1 equals 0 0.010 meters to x2 equals 0 0.030 meters. We can work this out. We know that the f0 is 4.0 newtons that the x is going to be uh, x2 minus x1, so that'd be 0 0.030 meters minus 0 0.010 meters, plus now uh, this 1 fourth with the 1 ninth becomes 1 over 36, so I'm going to say 1 over 36, and then the X zero is 0 0.0050 meters cubed like that. And now I have to evaluate the X to the fourth 
from the big number to the small number. So I'm going to say 0 0.030 meters to the fourth minus 0 0.010 meters to the fourth, like that. And then that closes off my curly brackets. And I get 4.0 newtons times curly brackets. This is 0 0.020 meters. And then plus, now I'm going to do some, some whirly gigging math. 1 over 36, for instance, 0 0.0050 squared. So I'm going to do 36 times point zeros, and actually that's cubed, not squared, point zero zero five cubed. Whoa. Whoa. I'm going to raise it to the three power. So that's really, really big. And now I'm going to invert that. So I'm going to raise that number to the negative one power. And that gives me 3.47 times 10 to the negative 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 to the negative ninth. Uh, and that would be meters to the negative 3 power. Now that takes the whole place of that fraction there, the 1 over 36, so on and so forth. Now I'm going to do 0 0.03 raised to the fourth power, that's going to give me 8.1 times 10 to the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So 8.10 times 10 to the negative seventh meters to the fourth minus, now I'm going to do the point zero 0.01, I'm going to raise that to the fourth power. And that gives me 1.00 times 10 to the negative 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 10 to the negative 8 meters to the fourth, like that. And then a curly bracket. Sorry, the arithmetic takes forever here. But now I'm going to say 0 0.020 meters plus... Uh, let's do uh, 8.1 times 10 to the negative 7th minus 1 times 10 to the negative 8. That gives me, I already had the 3.47 times 10 to the negative 9 reciprocal meters cubed. Now, I just did the subtraction there, and that gave me 8.00 times 10 to the negative 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So that's 10 to the negative 7th meters to the 4th, like that. And there's my curly bracket. So if I multiply that by 3.47 times 10 to the negative 9th, that gives me 4.0 newtons times 0 0.020 meters plus 2.78 times 10 to the negative 15th meters. Notice the meters to the fourth divided by the meters cubed gives me just plain meters. So I have that. That's actually a very, very, very small addition to the 0 0.02. Uh, in fact, we're probably not going to see that at all because when I add 0 0.02 to it, I get 0 0.02. And now I multiply that by 4, and that gives me 0 0.08. So the total work is 0 0.0800 joules. So that was the total work. Uh, I will point out to you guys that this quantity right here is like 0 0.020 plus 0 0.1234567891 
10, 11, 12, 13, 14, and then 2, 7, 8. So that's what really happened there. There's no reason to include the 2.78 times to the negative 15th. So any questions on that one? Okay, well, that calculation of a uh, of a work using these integrals is what allows us to ultimately define uh, what potential energy is, because what we're going to do is we're going to discover that there's certain forces in nature that allow conservation of energy. Those forces we call conservative. And what makes a force conservative is... Uh, numerous things, one of which is if you integrate, in other words, calculate the work done by a that type of force in a closed loop, then the work will be zero. Additionally, if you calculate the work done by that force and going from A to B, say, then that's going to turn out to be a difference in a function evaluated at B minus that same function evaluated at A. So it's it's literally like you can reduce the integral to just a certain function uh, evaluated at the endpoints of the range of integration. That's another condition. A third condition is that something called the curl of the force is zero. And uh, it turns out it, in mathematics, there's this theorem that basically says if the curl of a force field is zero, then there exists a scalar potential U such that the force F is equal to the negative gradient of U and those other things I told you were true. So that's ultimately what we're using here. And that's gonna come in handy because later we're gonna find out that we can use that again uh, when we're talking about electric forces and magnetic forces, and uh, if we want to go back to the gravitational force, since it looks just like the Coulomb force, we know that the, both the Coulomb force and the gravitational force are conservative forces. I've already done the derivation of the kinetic of the work energy principle. That derivation of the work energy principle is where we got the concept that kinetic energy is equal to one half mv squared, or what Madame de Chatelet called the oomph. That, that was what her one half mv squared is. She's a very interesting character. I highly recommend uh, you guys looking into the history of her. I think at the ripe old age of like 16, she started translating Newton's Principia from Latin to French. And uh, of course, she wasn't just someone that could uh, know the languages and do a conversion or a, a translation. She was a person that was building on physics as well. Uh, she had already encountered, in fact, the concept of oomph uh, even before the Newton's Principia. And in fact, uh, as a little bit older lady, she became, well, I should say Voltaire became her boy toy. So imagine some uh, woman that was so smart at even such a young age that Voltaire was like her boy toy. That should give you an idea of how uh, beautifully intelligent this woman is. Uh, yeah, she was brilliant. Sadly, she died at a young age in childbirth uh, when she was given birth to her actual husband, who was not, not the Voltaire. So anyways, that's Madame de Chatelet. I have no idea how to spell it, but you can you certainly Google it. Uh, so the crux of all this is we now know a formula that in general work is equal to the integral of f dot dl. We also know the work energy theorem, which says that the net work done is equal to the change in kinetic energy. And we've learned that kinetic energy is defined to be one half mv squared. So that delta k is equal to one half m the final squared minus one half m the initial squared. So that's some of the terminology and stuff we've learned. Now in the next chapter, which we're, we're done now with this chapter, in the next chapter, we're going to go into uh, using conservation of energy. I will tell you there's uh, like two more really good, simple examples using the work energy theorem. 
I, I want you to look at that. I don't think they're hard enough for me to actually do it. Well, actually, I've got a little bit of time. Let's let's do one of them at least. So let's do example seven dash seven. And what we have here is a, a baseball. Oops. Has a one hundred and forty eight point zero gram. Actually, I should put a dash between that. One hundred and forty eight point zero gram mass. And is thrown. at V equals 25, I'll call that 25.0, point zero, point zero meters per second. A, what is its kinetic energy? And B, what is the required net work. Okay. So solution, what we're using here is uh, for starters, we need to figure out K and K is equal to one half MV squared. And that's what will help us with part A. And then with part B, I cannot stand that. Uh, and then with part B, what we'll make use of is that W net equals the change in kinetic energy. So we'll make use of that. Let's start with part A. Kinetic energy for the baseball is equal to one half times 0 0.1480 kilograms. Notice I did have to convert that to kilograms. But luckily, the velocity is exactly 25.0 meters per second. So I don't have to convert that to other units because it's already in meters per second. And that's going to be squared. So when I do this, I get 0.5 times 0.148 times 25 squared. That gives me 46.25 joules for the kinetic energy. So I'm going to circle that and recommend, recognize that as part A. Now part B, W net is equal to delta K, which equals K final minus K initial. Uh, we are actually going on the assumption that the ball is thrown from an initial velocity of zero. So the initial velocity of zero means the kinetic energy initially is also going to be zero. So we're ultimately going to get that uh, this is just equal to 46.25 joules. So that's equal to W net. Anybody have any questions on that? Okay. Now we're actually at the end of class. Uh, the example 7-8 is the one that I didn't do, but that's pretty trivial. It's just using a car. Example 7-9 is another one, just using a car. And example 7-10, I, I might do some more of these next time, but I'm definitely considering this uh, ended. You should be able to go ahead and work all the homework problems for chapter uh, 7. Uh, I want to say that's due Sunday, but I think I'm going to go ahead and since you guys meet on Mondays and uh, Mondays and Wednesdays, I want to make it due Tuesday night. OK, so that gives you a little bit more time, uh, but I, I think it's good enough. I will wait here for the last person to leave in case anybody has any questions, but you guys are all free to go. If you didn't already chat me your first and last name, please do so. But thanks for coming, everybody. Thank you. Have a good night. You too. Thank you. Thanks.
Corey, do you have a question or are you just not here anymore? Looks like you might not be here. So I'm going to go ahead and end it. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Oh, gotcha. Thanks, Corey.